and uh, come to uh, coming to chaitanya samrani chaitanya what has changed in the history of indian curation since 1992 broadly or how has its status evolved since then i mean just give me a brief structure that will do because you were there since you know since the very uh, beginning of it and uh, you you had had projects uh, where the notion the term curating didn't apply like you know this is following an early conversation of ours um me personally and you know also the broader scenario right 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 um look um i i finished my masters in 95 in baroda so um regardless of what else was happening um beginning couldn't have been any any earlier for me so i'm i'm sort of chronologically limited in that sense um but um it it seems to me that george watt for instance who organized the delhi darbar exhibition of 1903 um mulkraj anand richard bartholomew swaminathan geeta kapoor in her early years all of them were doing work that was not called curatorship at that time they were organizers of exhibitions sometimes they were the ideologues of exhibitions um they were in many ways doing quite a lot of the work that curators do now um they were generating a set of ideas to which artists could respond they were selecting works being in dialogue with artists working as intermediaries between artists and institutions um but the name curator was never applied to their designations at that time um so the curator is in a way not such a young creature in india uh, there is there is a history of curatorship that uh, but it does not have that name it gained currency i think much much later yeah now uh, what were your concerns regarding representing indian art since you had uh, had this experience of working both within the country and in asia as well and then in the again in the abroad what were your concerns regarding representing indian art both inside the country in asia as well as in the abroad and also i'd like to know if there are differences in representing the same representing the same artist within the country and elsewhere in the world sure um now as 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 it happened in my particular case the majority of my professional career has been spent in australia um so i worked in india for only 3 years after i finished my degree in baroda and um and i've lived in australia ever since so uh, the larger part of my work has taken place outside india the only project that i curated while i was still in india um the only two things that i curated while i was still in india one in baroda and then um, the other which was an india australia exchange project um they were they were done in the very early years of my career but since then and as as an expatriate um of course i'm extremely aware of some of the problems and pitfalls that haunt the representation of art from another place especially when there may not be um there may not be considerable sophistication in terms of contextual information amongst the audience that lives for instance in perth or in mexico city um where 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 some of these things have happened um there there is one of the major one of the major things to watch out for for my For, for, from my point of view has been the the problem of the spectacle and um this peculiarly haunts the destiny of art from the so called third world when it starts hitting the so called art capitals of the world uh, elsewhere and uh, there is inevitably the temptation to present it as spectacle um spectacle always works in terms of populist museum policy um museums sometimes love the spectacular 
and uh, they expect the curator to deliver spectacle. Um, they, they are working within, of course, their own policy and economic constraints, uh, which often means that they are taking a big leap into the unknown by saying, okay, uh, we are going to have the first exhibition of contemporary Indian art that is going to travel Australia, the USA, Mexico, and come back to India, which, which I did 2004 to 2007. Um, and they need to satisfy their constituencies, which includes very often the foundations or the nation state that owns those museums, their own bureaucracies and their audiences who need to be schooled, who need to be sort of brought up to speed with what's happening in that far away remote corner of the world, um, and for them to understand that it's not just about elephants, that there are, that there are, um, that there are activities um, of contemporary art production and dialogue that uh, in many ways um, need to be taken very seriously and need to be learned from. Um, what what often I have found we run into in that process is um, what I've started calling the problem of footnoting. How much footnoting do you need to do to make a certain thing comprehensible outside its own context? Um, and that is a problem that haunts not just curatorship, but it haunts art history generally. It haunts the work of the critic, as, as it was discussed yesterday. Um, how do you make something legible um, when the conditions of legibility uh, are so uneven, in, in, regardless of how many declarations we, we might make about uh, a globalized situation. The conditions of legib legibility, the institutional conditions, are markedly different across different places. And, um, and, and, and so that's, that's, that's definitely something that I've had to engage with um, uh, over a long period of time now. How have you interrogated history and regional particularities in your curatorial projects? Um, as, as, as somebody who, who, um, who is primarily an academic and only secondarily a curator or writer, um, th this, this question of interrogating history is very close to my heart. Um, because I, I'm, I'm basically a teacher who sometimes does other things. Um, and um, the, the, the idea of being able to articulate a historical interrogation into the space of an exhibition, into the space of a display, into the space of a discourse around an exhibition, um, is, it's, not, it's not a seamless translation. It's, um, it's often quite complicated. Um, uh, let me take the example of Edge of Desire, which was the, 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 it was a big exhibition that started its life in, in Australia and then went on elsewhere. We um, also had about 38 Indian artists from different corners of the country, uh, also taking into inclusion uh, the folk artists as well. Yes. Um, the way Age of Desire came about was out of an interrogation of how we in India and other people in other parts of the world construct the networks that legitimize different kinds of practices as being modernist or contemporary, um, and, and institutions themselves. Um, in, the, in the Indian case, we've, we've, we've had um, a tremendous relationship, often a one-way relationship, between urban and rural art. Um, the, 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 the art of... Um, people uh, working outside the academy trained English speaking white cube space um, has provided a great deal of material um, for, for, for urban artists from um, the beginning of Indian modernity and um, it, it seems to me that the, the, the inherent imbalance um, that, that persists in that situation can be mapped on to questions of um, caste, questions of class, questions of access to um, um, privilege, really. It's a, it, it, is, it, is a, it is very deeply a question of privilege. And um, it, it, it was, it was um, um, it, this is something that Jyotindra Jain and K.G. Subramanian have, have uh, and Gulam Sheikh have uh, written about in the past, and they have, in fact, uh, 
put that into practice in their exhibitions as well. So it was not like I was working without precedent.